Today we're going to be working on the layout for um, the gridded project. Based on the work of Chuck Close, we'll be converting a photocopy into a transferred image using carbon paper and creating a arrangement for using grid on top of a portrait. It's very important that your picture contains a really strong uh, contrast between light and dark. So in my case, I actually used a clamp light and held it to the side. A flashlight would work fine or a desk lamp would also work really well. After we produced the original, I put it on a photocopier and expanded it 300% to create an image that would fill the paper to create a sort of pop art feel to the final product. At this point, I've taken my enlarged photocopy and I've added a piece of tape over the top to create a hinge. You'll see that it can be lifted up and put back down. Once it's in place, I'm going to use a piece of carbon paper, remembering to of course put it dark surface down. Why is that important? Because if you put it in light surface down, your image won't transfer. So I'm going to slide this under. Don't need to tape down the carbon paper. And remember, save the carbon paper for another day. Um, it's usable multiple times. And I'm just going to put a teeny bit of tape at the top and the bottom, not so that it goobers up the carbon paper, but just so that um, it makes it easier to see um, and not slide around. My next project, part of the project, is to um, to sell out each of the value changes in the composition. What do I mean by that? Well, if there's a highlight, I'm going to put a cell on that highlight. If there's a change in value, I'm going to create that change in value as a circular shape, a cell. You can see I'm putting some here and here. I had done a few of these prior to this video. But you can still see what I'm doing. I'm trying to convert each value change. If it gets darker, I'm going to put in those. Also, for things like teeth, be sure to separate the teeth into individual shapes. If you draw it as a single shape, it will read like dentures in the final product. And that can be um, not as appealing in your final image. The next thing I want to think about is how do I make each of these cell forms uh, carry the description. I don't want lines that are just simply lines hanging out there by themselves, but I want each of them to form a shape, what I'm calling a cell. I'm going to also outline this part of my lip, this part of my lip. Um, looks to me like you might want to have some parts of it read like a topographical map. By that I mean that it might have like a highlighted space, and then the next layer behind, and the next layer behind. And that will also give you some dimension in your final product. Now, you'll see that I've done quite a bit of the tracing already. I want to include, of course, my apron, my collar, my shoulder, my fingers down here. I'm also trying to look and see if I missed any pieces of the uh, light and dark, the wrinkles on my fingers themselves. And if I have background space that I really want to articulate in my final product, I'm going to create some lines for that. Many people will ask me about how the hair operates. And I think you want to pick out a few linear type shapes, cells, that will um, imply the direction of hair. But don't get so caught up in every single hair that you get kind of crazy about it. Um, so. Here I am, I'm going to finish out these couple of things. In my final form, it will have trace transferred through. Now you're going to see on this lower one that I've already traced through many of those components to create an underneath portion. Now you can see I've already put the grid onto this one because I did this for a demonstration last week. So your transferred form is going to look like this right here, all broken into cells based on the picture. And I'm going to show you the picture as well. And then the next step is to take your ruler and break the surface into some kind of a grid. Now, it's not really important to me that it be a uh, right angle grid or diamonds or large squares. There are many possibilities. Your grid can be tighter together, wider apart. Um, in this case, I simply went 
with diagonals and added my lines over the top to create a grid over the whole surface. By using the grid, we fracture the color into a lot of little teeny pieces, and it ensures that the final product will have a lively energy that is present when we have lots of colors in the final product. Um, so you need a grid over the whole surface. I have had students use things like camouflage, um, a floral pattern, waving lines that undulate across the surface in a kind of op art sort of way. I've had students choose things where their, their diamonds were elongated. Um, I've had students who choose a grid that gets thinner and thicker. And those changes all operate really well in the final product. When you're choosing a grid for your portrait, you want to think about what style of grid works best for your idea. In the case of this student, they've chosen to do a half inch right angle grid and measured out diagonally across the composition at half inch intervals to make sure they're all equal in size. For this student, they've elected to create their grid with a wider grid at the outside edge and getting narrower and narrower as it crosses the face and then wider again as it goes beyond. And then working from the bottom up, wider, narrower, 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 wider, wider. So you can see that that adjustment in grid creates focus and energy around the facial part and simplifies the hands and the outer edges. For this student, they elected to do the whole thing with the same size of rectangle form, and that creates the grid over theirs. By going with this larger scale, they had to think about ways to break up each square much more completely. I would say that the larger square can create um, its own problems, so don't look at that and think, oh, that'll be fast and simple. It's actually a little more complicated. For this student, they were working with a purple palette, and they wanted everything to be in a sort of neutral place. If you'll recall when we talked about the mother color theory earlier in the semester, we used a color that was mixed with each shade as they went along to create a softer, more static composition. This student elected to choose a mother color of purple and added a little bit of purple to each shade. Her square size is a right angle quarter inch square, which gives you a lot of clarity and a lot of specificity about the portrait itself. For this student here, she wanted to use a waving line for her face and a right angle half inch for her background. If you want to change up the kind of grid that you use in your portrait, that could be also very effective. You can see that she just randomly ran curves down the face and across, and then when she got to the background, she shifted over into that much more structured half inch square worked very well and very effectively for this one. For this one right here, again, we have the half inch portrait and she's working with a very intense color palette. I, again, am fine with whatever color palette you choose, but keep in mind that whatever color palette you choose has to have dark for the values, light for the highlights, warm colors, to bring one element forward, and cooler shades or cooler forms of that color to bring other parts back. So I will be grading you on warm to cool, dark to light, and near to far. This composition uses the spider web. It involves using a set of concentric rings that describe a grid that spans out from a single section of the composition. It's important to remember that with the spider web, you want to focus it on something you want to draw attention to. The spider web often looks very strange if it comes off the tip of the nose, but it works very well for an eye, for the flash of glasses. I've had students use the spider web above their head like a halo, that's very effective. I've also had them work it off a tooth as though they had a gleaming tooth. It was very funny. Um, so think about where the center apex of your spider web will be. You can use a compass or a set of drinking glasses to create those concentric rings. And after that, you wanna think again about what is the warmest part, the nearest part. In this case, the student chose to have her warmest portions be the center of the forehead, down the center of the nose, the front of the lip, 
and the front of each cheek. And then as she got to the outside edges of the composition, she added softer, grayer, and more cool tones using violet and brown. At the end of our filling in all of our colors on these gridded portraits, you may want to add a secondary layer to modify some of the colors, creating stronger highlights, stronger dark, or even just the synergy that is created when two colors overlap one another. In this painting, um, I worked on adding little bits of other shades over the top to create some more dapple within the portrait and to create some color energy. You can also see that for this painting, I worked on top of a blue background. If you're interested in the blue background, you need to sort of put that on ahead of time. So when you do your preparation, you may want to put a thin layer, very thin so you can see your pencil lines, a thin layer of color.